Sir David Amis. I begin, Mr Speaker, by thanking local residents in South End West for re-electing me again as a Member of Parliament. Yeah. I have always regarded it as a great privilege to be a Member of Parliament, not a right, and I am absolutely delighted to be returned again. I would also, Mr Speaker, like to congratulate the proposer and the seconder of the gracious speech. My right honourable friend, the member for Chelmsford, is a well-known wag. On this occasion, he did not disappoint the House. The one issue that I disagreed with him about, and I will always disagree with him about, is the Democratic Party in the United States of America and Mrs Clinton. I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, I put the Clintons in exactly the same bracket as the Blairs. Never mind, my right honourable friend, the member for Chelmsford, made a splendid speech. I also would like to congratulate my honourable friend, the member of Parliament for uh, South East Cornwall. She was a contributor to my pamphlet on working class Conservatives, the party of opportunity, and I thought she made a magnificent speech this afternoon. And as we all know, she suffered a terrible tragedy shortly after her election to this place, and I think her family and friends can be very proud of her. Now, Mr Speaker, before getting into the bones of the gracious speech, I wanted to make a few remarks about the general election campaign. And I say this in a friendly way to all honourable members. We only had the general election this month, and I do think it's slightly arrogant if we sort of dismiss what the verdict of the electorate was. They just took the decision this month, and I think it's a little early to start rubbishing the decisions which they made. I thought, Mr Speaker, the coverage of the general election campaign was an absolute disgrace for all sorts of reasons. There were no big issues uh, shown by the media in the radio or TV day in and day out, and I do not want to fall out with the Scottish Nationalist Party at this stage because I hope that they will become my friends. I might even need their support in various matters uh, in, in months and years to come. But I, I would say that canvassing on the doorstep it was an absolute irritation to the residents of South End West that every time they went into their lounge and turned the TV on, there was the leader of the Scottish Nationalist Party keep talking about locking the Prime Minister out of Number 10 Downing Street. Now, I would have thought, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the only person entitled to lock the Prime Minister out of 10 Downing Street was the Prime Minister's wife, if he had been <laughs> misbehaving himself. But I do think it was very, very unfortunate, the tone. And the only other thing that the media coverage was their endless obsession with no party would get an overall control. So I think the six weeks of the campaign, I was totally against fixed-term parliaments, was very, very disappointing indeed. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was elected to this place in June 1983. I'm not an old boy yet, but I see looking at the list, I'm number five in length of service on the Conservative side yeah, yeah, and number yeah, yeah, 15 yeah. in the House. But I haven't lost my marbles yet. And I can remember what it was like to be elected as a new Member of Parliament. And I wish to congratulate all colleagues, those who were re-elected, but particularly those of all parties elected here for the first time. Now, I was going to address some remarks to my own side. Uh, for one moment, I thought there were no newly elected Members of Parliament here. They all seem to have got bored. Uh, they all seem to have got bored pretty quickly until my honourable friend, the member of Braintree, decided to uh, join us. But there are many newly elected members of Parliament opposite. This place has changed uh, beyond all recognition from when uh, uh, you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I joined here in June 1983. But I think that everyone will welcome colleagues and be as helpful as they possibly uh, can to ensure that everyone uh, is made to feel at home here. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the result which gave me the greatest pleasure was that of my honourable uh, friend, the member for Thurrock. She yeah. epitomises yeah. everything that is good about Essex Woman. She wasn't just in a two-way fight, she was in a three-way marginal. And I observed, thinking about my own circumstances in 1992, the pressure that she was under was absolutely extraordinary. And I think those dreadful opinion polls every day, every week, every month, every year, telling her that she was going to come third must have absolutely dispirited her. Yet she triumphed. I'm fascinated. I, mean, I agree with him, by the way, about, about the, uh, the member for Thurrock. She's a magnificent lady. But the, does he agree with me that there's an argument for doing away with, with these opinion polls for the entire duration of the general election? Uh, well, my right honourable friend has stolen a uh, part of my speech. Uh, the gracious speech says that um, other measures will, will be laid before you. I absolutely think we should now ban opinion polls during the three weeks. We must never have a six-week campaign again during the three weeks of the election. I mean, day in and day out, these ridiculous opinion yeah. polls, and there's no humility from the media. They're just carrying on as if they got it right. And never forget what the BBC told us about the exit polls. They told us that the Conservatives would be the largest party at 10 o'clock with, I think, 316. <coughs> Grateful to my honourable friend. The problem with banning opinion polls, you can't ban private ones. We just have people giving rumour and speculation. And it's far better to let the press and the pollsters get on with it and accept criticism and help in getting it better right, more right, more often. Well, I was once my uh, right honourable friend's PPS for a little while, but I'm not going to fall out with him on that matter, <laughs> but uh, I don't agree with him. Uh, as far... Honourable friend, for giving way, does not agree with me that what would be better is reforming the BBC, yeah. whose coverage, yeah. whose coverage—I didn't say privatise it. That's your suggestion, um, but whose coverage of the elections was biased and was unfair against a number of the parties in this house, and that's where the government should put its efforts in the years ahead. The honourable member, as father from heaven, would absolutely agree with him. But again, I was going to mention that in my speech. Just to get back to the opinion polls, it's absolutely ridiculous. The exit poll from the BBC said the Conservatives would be the largest party, I think, with 289 seats or something. They even got that wrong. And yet all these people commentating on the general election, they're carrying on just as if nothing has happened. Absolutely ridiculous, and elected parliamentarians need to do something about it. So I do agree with the Honourable Member. We've got a new Secretary of State for uh, Media, Culture and Sport. Now, when he was chairing the Select Committee, he seemed to have an awful lot to say about the British Broadcasting Corporation. Each parliament we talk about doing something about it. Now is the time that we should actually take action on, on that matter. Um, does my old friend recall that in the last day of the last Parliament, the European Scrutiny Committee submitted a report on the question of the manner in which the BBC has treated the European issue over the years, which is an all-party, unanimous report, and would he not agree if it was a very good idea in the present circumstances for everybody to have a good read of it? Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with my honourable friend, even though I don't seem to be getting injury time for the interventions. But um, I certainly do agree with my honourable friend. Now, turning, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the gracious speech, uh, there's no secret why the Conservatives were uh, returned to government. Uh, it's because the gracious speech says that uh, the government will legislate in the interests of everyone in our country. And the British people believed it. And then, we, in the gracious speech, we said we will provide economic stability and security at every stage of life. And the British people believe that. And then finally, in the gracious speech, we said there should be full employment and provide more people with the security of job. Well, the British people have believed that that is what the Conservative Party uh, is going to do. And then we said legislation will be introduced to support home ownership, something very much recalling my days in Basildon, the British people want. And I have to say to the House, if any member didn't find immigration an issue on the doorstep, I don't know what they were doing. Now, of course, there are enormous benefits brought to this country through immigration, but it is an issue, 
and it needs dealing with. And I think in particular, uh, I look forward to what the government is going to propose in terms of benefit allocations. And again, the British people were attracted by what is in the gracious speech about securing the future of the National Health Service by implementing the National Health Service's own five-year plan, and this we will watch very carefully. They were also impressed with the commitment to secure the real value of the basic state pension. And it was certainly an issue in South End West that constituents are increasingly angered, not going to get involved in the Scottish measure, but when we're dealing with just English issues, there must be a situation where only English members of Parliament vote on that particular issue. I'm delighted that uh, we are going to renegotiate the United Kingdom's relationship with the European Union. If only opposition parties hadn't stopped it in the last parliament, we would have had the referendum yeah, before yeah. 2017. I am old enough to have been given the opportunity to vote in, in uh, the 70s. I voted no then. Good luck to the Prime Minister if he thinks he can renegotiate things successfully, and I will make my judgment on the time. I have to say to members of the House, oh, go and, uh, and, and uh, listening to people's comments on the doorstep, I suspect even when we do have the referendum, uh, young people in particular, regardless of how it's renegotiated, uh, are giving me the impression that they will uh, vote to stay in the European Union. I also very much support the proposal for a British Bill of Rights. And I was so glad, Mr Deputy Speaker, not to see anything in the gracious speech on fox hunting. Now, uh, I've always voted against fox hunting, not for class issues, if people want to dress up in their red uh, uniforms. It all looks marvellous, but I can't think it's a lot of fun if you're a fox being torn apart by a couple of dogs. I shouldn't think a human being would want it, so I'm very glad that that isn't actually in the gracious speech. In terms of foreign affairs, uh, I'm very glad that I was one of the 30 Conservative uh, members of Parliament who voted against us getting involved in uh, a conflict in Syria, and I'm pleased to see that we're going to try and get a political settlement. Uh, I'm very glad that we are going to put pressure on Russia to respect the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the Ukraine. I'm delighted that we're going to try to defeat terrorism in the Middle East, and I, I would have liked to have seen in the gracious speech some sort of commitment that when we have public enquiries, they actually report it's crazy that we still haven't got the Chilcot report, and the sooner that is published, the better, because I want to see if I was or was not misled over the war with Iraq. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I say again, uh, I am very grateful to uh, constituents in South and West for re-electing me. I congratulate all the new ministers, uh, but I, I put them on this warning that I want them to read letters that they send to me very, very carefully, not just sign off what the civil servant has plonked in front of them. Because in South End, I want South End to have city status after our magnif a magnificent victory in the uh, football contest at the weekend, uh, where we've been promoted to Division uh, 1. I think we are entitled to become a city. I want fair funding for grammar schools. I very much want to see something done about uh, cliff slippage in South End. I want uh, the senior management of South End Hospital and SEP sorted out. And I very much intend to make sure that the voice of South End is heard loudly and firmly in this Parliament. And my final thoughts, Mr Deputy Speaker, which I wrote here as I was listening to it, I hope that all of us will show humility in victory and all of us will show humility in defeat. Yeah.